Hey, Tyler, have you ever wanted to make your own podcast? Absolutely, I have. Well, if you want to make your podcast, you should go to Anchor. It's the easiest way to make a podcast. Here's why. For one, it's free to use, no monthly fees. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so you don't need any of that special equipment. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership, and it's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. If Jeff and I can make a podcast using Anchor, literally anybody can. So, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. The following podcast is a member of the Pokecasters Network. Pokecasters Network, supporting Pokemon content creators, their shows, and the community of Pokemon fans. To find out more, check out PokeCastersNetwork.com or find us on Twitter and Facebook. Hi everyone, and welcome to episode 15 of the Pokemon Snapshot. Hi Tyler, how are you? Oh, I'm doing pretty fantastic, Jeff, because I've got three weeks off of work for the holidays this year. Lucky you. I still have to work next week, but I get the whole week of Christmas off, which is amazing. I need to get caught up on all of my shows and video games I want to play, but as usual, I'll probably go back and just play the same old stuff and watch the same old stuff. Oh, I know how that goes. It's a vicious cycle of wanting to start new things and just keep on doing the same stuff over and over. Like not exercising for me. True. There are too many video games. That is absolutely true. All right, and let's get into some information before we get started. Remember, you can join the Pokecasters Network on December 19th on Twitch from 10 a.m. to 1 a.m. Eastern Time. And they will be hosting a charity event for the Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. Uh, And here is the Pokemon Go FM host to tell us more. What's up, everybody? It's your boy Bagel Noob. I'm the host of Pokemon Go FM and the vice president of the Pokecasters Network. Now, I wanted to reach out to everybody to let you guys know about our upcoming charity event on Saturday, December 19th. That will be hosted all day on our Twitch channel. This event is one that we're going to call our Charity Tabletop Extravaganza, and it's an all-day event starting at 10 a.m. Eastern, going into Sunday the 20th. This charity event will star many of your favorite Pokemon and tabletop podcasters as a cast of Pokemon trainers, announcers, and judges at a world tournament hosted in Pokemon Black 2 and Pokemon White 2's Dravel City. Our story will open on the top eight as some of the world's toughest trainers compete to be the world champion. The trainers will not only have to face each other, but some very mysterious foes. So you, the fans and listeners, have the chance to influence the game. Now, you can do that in several different ways. You can do it by donating to give your favorite trainers advantage on their roles. You can do it by donating to help change the field in which the trainers are battling, much like in anime or Super Smash Brothers. You can even donate to help trigger random events. In addition to using your donations to impact the game and story, you can also win tons of prizes. We have a lot, a lot of prizes for you guys. We have several hundred dollars worth of Pokemon merchandise, including a plethora of really amazing merch from our sponsor, Giraffe Dice, who you can find on Facebook. Now, the best part of all of this is that all the proceeds go to helping sick children. So you can purchase raffle tickets and prizes, even if you cannot attend and win some really great merch while doing good. So come, join us throughout the day. Bring your friends, bring some snacks, and bring your beverage of choice. Help us make a difference this holiday season and end this crummy year on a high note. And once the event is done, we'll upload the audio to our new Pokecasters Network podcast feed where you can not only find your favorite shows, but additional content from our charity events and community events. You can find the feed on Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, and Spotify. And coming soon, we'll have it on iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, podcast and amazon podcast for more information you can check out pokecasters network on twitter facebook pokecastersnetwork.com or in our discord channel thank you everyone and we hope to see you there so if you want to watch this 
please tune into Twitch, and I'm going to try to jump into the chat and see how it's going. And you should join as well. Remember, they are sponsored by Giraffe Dice, which make these awesome Pokemon-themed polyhedral dice. I still need to buy myself a set, Tyler. Yeah, I do too. All right, and uh, some other news before we get into our typical stuff. Uh, I, Jeff, was on the Up and Comer podcast hosted by Josh Biddick. So if you want to hear about my history with content creation and where I got started before doing this podcast, please give him a listen and maybe find some other content creators you may be interested in listening to. Yeah, I thought he did a great job. It's actually a show I might have to tune into. Um, but I will say this. I, I listened to Jeff's interview, and I just want to throw out there that if you listen to the interview, you're going to hear a part where he says that I'm the eye candy of the show and then goes on to um, say something to the effect of, good thing this is an audio-only show. And Jeff, I just want to go on the record and say, that hurt. I'm sorry, Tyler. Do you forgive me? I will when you start paying me. All right, and if you want to get in contact with us, make sure to go to Twitter and tweet at us at Pokemon Snapshot, or send us an email at thepokemonsnapshot at gmail.com. But that's about it, Tyler, so are we ready to get into the episode? Oh yeah, I'm ready to get into this bad boy. All right, so as stated before, this is episode 15, and it was called Battle Aboard the Saint Anne, or in Japanese, it was called Battle on the Saint Anu. It aired on July 8th, 1997 in Japan, and on September 7th, 1998 in the United States. Now, if you were listening to last week's episode, you're like, wait, this aired before the episode, all the other episodes? And yes, this actually aired as a sneak peek in the United States, but it wasn't shown everywhere, I guess. Some, some areas ran the annual Jerry Lewis MDA Labor Day Telethon instead. Interesting fact. Tyler, you you remember when telethons were a thing? I think they still aren't they still a thing. I guess I haven't seen one in years. Yeah, I guess we call them charity streams now. Ah, yes. So the old people <laughs> version of a charity stream, aka us. Yes. Yeah, so, but I thought that was interesting. Could you imagine this being your first episode you see of the Pokemon anime? This is before the. Games came out, you may have seen stuff in, like, Nintendo Power or something like that, but this is the first episode that you would see. Uh, and then it did originally air in... In chronological order, it aired on September 27th, 1998. All right, Tyler, what, let's get into the episode. We begin our episode with Ash and his party walking across a bridge in a tropical-looking city. It actually gave me some uh, Miami vibes a little bit, um, but without all the Cuban stuff. They come upon a large cruise ship, and the narrator says, Has Ash's ship finally come in, or will he be cruising for a bruising? I did an audible groan at this pun. It was so bad. It really was bad, like, it, and it was so obvious. Like, I, I knew for a fact that something to that effect was going to be said, and they did not let me down in a bad way. Ash and the party marvel at the ship and talk about how they could, would like to cross the ocean on a ship like that. Brock marvels at all the Pokemon that they could catch if they did, and Misty dreams of sunbathing on the deck and relaxing. And Misty, I just gotta throw this out there. Uh, Misty, you're very fair-complected, you are a redhead, so I really hope that if you are, in fact, planning on sunbathing on a ship for a long period of time, that you're, you're getting some sunblock on, okay? Some really, really strong, powerful sunblock, and limiting your skin ex ex skin exposure, because skin cancer's no joke, kids. Yeah, and Misty's fantasy was actually cut out from the Hindi dub, probably due to her being in a bikini. They didn't like, you know, that show on 10-year-old girls in bikinis. Understandable. Uh, also an interesting fact, the Saint Anne is the name of the original ship in the Japanese version. Because, do you remember, Tyler, in Pokemon Red and Blue over here, it was not called the Saint Anne. Yeah, I couldn't remember the name, but I just remembered the ship part. Yeah, it was called the SS Anne, and my guess is that the dubber dubbers never played the game, so they were just going straight off of what they saw in the anime from the Japanese version. Okay, interesting. 
Brock then rains on everyone's parade, as he is wanton to do, by saying that they could never afford a cruise like that. This kills the mood, and everyone gets sad and begins to walk away. Just then, two people who are obviously Team Rocket in a spray and, and like a fake spray tan and dyed hair, and they're wearing schoolgirl outfits. Yes, even James is wearing a schoolgirl outfit right now. Show up and offer them free tickets to go to a party on the Saint Anne cruise ship. Jesse explains that the party is for Pokemon trainers only and sell it up as being this like big radical party. You know, those were her exact words. She's like, this is radical. And Ash whispers to Misty, do you know anybody who says radical anymore? And Misty nods that she does not. Jesse then hands them the tickets and Brock says that they don't have the money to pay for the tickets. Really, Brock? Really? She already said they were free. It was one of the first things that she said. Brock, so far this episode has continued to be a bit uh, slow to the uptake. He probably thought that they were just making sure it wasn't a scam because, you know, have have you, you ever gotten those calls? Like, there's that one call where you answer your phone and goes, Prong Kong, this is your captain speaking. Have you ever gotten that call, Tyler? I have never in my life heard of a call like that. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's like a spam call, and they it starts off that way. They they try to give away free cruise ship tickets, but they instead, once you say, oh yeah, I'll take that, they're like, well, you need, you know, the taxes. You just have to pay the taxes. It's a scam. So he was just probably making sure something like that was going on. And I was wondering how Team Rocket afforded the tickets anyway, if Ash and company could not. But it kind of is explained later on. Also, when you mentioned James dressed as a schoolgirl, in a couple episodes, it gets way worse. Just saying. Oh, I'm sure it does. I mean, this wasn't particularly bad, just a bit odd. Like, why did he have to dress like a schoolgirl? It didn't really seem to make any sense given what they were, you know, attempting to do. Uh, but, you know, and, and I also want to throw out there, Jeff, that I completely disagree with you on your assessment of the situation. Brock was just slow to the uptake here. There's a big difference between someone calling and, like, offering you free stuff or saying you want a million dollars and someone physically coming up to you and handing you tickets and saying, here's some free tickets to the ship. Like, that's a that's a big difference and, and, and a lot less scammy, in my opinion. Jesse again explains that the tickets are free. So after after Brock says, but are these tickets free? She goes, yes, they are free. Uh, but she says it in a really creepy way and says that they are free because they have to go with their boyfriend. She says she saw them and thought they looked really cool. And did she actually say their boyfriend, not their boyfriends? They said their boyfriends. Okay, I was just making sure. I'm like, maybe they share a boyfriend. You never know. I mean, in this case, I think it's pretty fair to assume there isn't actually a boyfriend. Like, I, I, they're in a disguise, Jeff. This is Team Rocket, and, and they're trying to lure Ash and the party onto his... Jeez, Jeff. You're, like, channeling your inner Brock in this episode. You gotta pull it together. This is gonna be a long one. Holy cow. They then hand the tickets. So Team Rocket hands over the tickets, and then they run away. Ash takes the tickets without question, which is definitely a very Ash thing to do. I would be, you know, I, I would think, oh, free tickets, this is awesome. But at the same time, it'd be like this whole thing was really weird. Like these two school girls, school girls that are just huge, you know, because obviously they're twice the size of them. Just come up and give me these tickets. Whatever. I guess I'm going on a cruise. Ash and the party begin walking towards the docks and Ash wonders which ship is the St. Anne. They find the ship because they were standing directly in front of it. It is a massive ship. And they begin to marvel at how cool it looks. Team Rocket watches from the bushes, and Jesse says they finally got them. James then says in a stereotypical girl voice, Don't I make the coolest girl? And Jesse hits him with a sludge hammer and tells him to stop, a stop acting like an ignoramus. And yet again, I'm surprised at some of the content that was left in for American audiences and content that was left out. Like we've had we have we've had hits censored before, yet Jesse just hit James with a literal sludge hammer, which would probably kill him in real life, but they left it in. Yeah, I still don't understand what that decides is okay, what isn't. I guess ones that look more cartoony are allowed. Like, hitting someone with a sledgehammer kind of things of the old Warner Brothers cartoons with, like, the anvils. But I was just surprised they used the word ignoramus in a show for kids. Yeah, maybe. I'm not sure. I'd have to build a time machine and go 
find out if 10-year-old me knew what that meant. I'm going to guess probably not. I, I did and still do have a very limited vocabulary. You were an ignoramus? Uh, I guess you could say that, yes. I was in <laughs> special ed reading, Jeff. Jeez, way to rip open an old wound. Team Rocket then appears in some sort of secret room in a secret lighthouse lair that overlooks the shipyard. They get a call from their boss, who is a silhouetted man in an orange suit. A Persian, the Pokemon, then comes up on the screen and begins rubbing its head against the boss's leg as cats do. Meowth is disappointed that he is no longer the boss's favorite. The boss tells Team Rocket that he is disgusted with watching their failures and says that he expects perfection, like his beautiful Persian. That's nice. This makes me out especially sad, however. The boss then explains that if they want to make him happy, then they can make sure that their latest plan succeeds. He then asks if they have handed out the tickets to the, to the party at the St. Anne. Jesse assures them that they have, and all the trainers they, were, they gave them to were very happy to take them. The boss then explains that his men have boarded the St. Anne, and when he gives the signal, they will take all of the Pokemon on board. Meow says that the boss is a real genius. The boss then says that this time failure is out of the question, and Team Rocket replies by saying, Aye, aye, sir. He then smirks at them. A couple comments related to this. Firstly, when was failure ever not out of the question? Is it not expected that they should succeed in their tasks? I just thought that that was kind of an odd thing to throw into your inspirational speech to your henchmen. Yeah, but maybe it's because he knows Jesse and James, that's all they've really done is fail. So he was just saying that since he is giving them the direction that, you know, you won't fail anymore because I'm the one telling you to do this. You are not working on your own whims here. I see. Yeah, I'm not really sure Jesse and James were ever doing anything that the boss really wanted. As we will soon see, their outfits are different than other Team Rocket members. That's very true, so they're kind of the wild cards of the group. My second comment related to this scene is, I like this new look at... I, I like this new look at Team Rocket that we're getting in this episode. Like, they were standing at attention while they were talking to him, like, you know, and, and they even saluted him at one point. And, and it was all very militaristic. Could it be that Team Rocket is some sort of paramilitary group? I think it's just it's showing how they really respect their boss. I believe this is the first time we've seen him, am I right? Uh, yes, it is. Like, all we've ever really heard of is them, we've got to get Pikachu for the boss. And that's all that we've really seen. And he hasn't even been given a name yet. And because I get yelled at for spoilers, I won't mention it here, but we will learn his name eventually. Okay. Do you know his name, Tyler? I don't remember it, no. Okay, so I won't spoil it for you. Good, no spoilers, Jeff Spoiler King. And by the way, I'm still sticking with the paramilitary thing. They've got the matching uniforms. They're saying, aye, aye, sir. They're saluting. They're standing at attention. Uh, we're, we're going paramilitary here. Plus, Jesse and James did have guns at one point and a bazooka. So I, they've got access to an arsenal. So, like, I imagine them having, like, some, like, paramilitary training course in the woods or something. It's all very, it all excites me. I like this look at Team Rocket. I don't think they would have survived that, so... I don't know if they had the training you think they have. It probably wasn't hard training. Okay. Like, let's be honest. There's lots of people that do, like, you know, paramilitary training and, and probably would not be very effective in a situation needing paramilitary training. We then change scenes to the St. Anne cruise ship. Ash is super excited and says that the ship is awesome. Misty says that she would like to travel the whole world in it. They are shown to a large room with tables and a staircase that reminds me of the one on the Titanic. You know, the one that Jack meets Rose at on the night uh, that they have a cheating love affair since Rose is technically engaged to another man. And then the night ends with Rose letting Jack die by floating in the icy waters of the North Atlantic. You know way too much about the movie Titanic. I just want to throw out, though, that Titanic has been seen by a lot of people. And, like, the scenes I referenced were, like, pretty... You know, common knowledge, Jeff. Let's not, let's not, let's not get at me for this. Like everyone knows how Jack dies. I mean, yes, I know, and there was obviously probably enough room for both of them on that board. There was. I've calculated it. I've calculated it with my science class. 
fun. Um, there's just been, it's been so long since I've seen it. Like I didn't know all the other underlying stuff, just the ending pretty much. Right. We also see vendors selling Pokeballs. It looks like a typical Pokemon convention. So they said it was a party up until this point, but it's obviously a Pokemon convention, but without the random unnecessary screeching and signs warning about how your body odor could get you removed. Um, and, and I do, and I do want to also point out that what's the deal with Pokemon and, and nerd conventions in general? Cause I've go to quite a few and every time I go to one of them, somebody somewhere in the room screeches. I don't know what the deal is with that. The ones you've gone to have, they've also had those signs because I have never seen signs like that at a convention. The body odor signs? The body odor signs. Yes. Yes. I've, I've definitely seen them and it's like a running thing on the internet. Like just Google Google uh Comic Con and body odor and you'll you'll get you'll get your you'll get your share. Like it's usually in the rules. We see two guys comparing their Charmanders, and another guy walks up with a squirtle and tells them to look at how hard its shell is. Ash commented from afar that his Charmander is much better than theirs. And this whole scene shows why I hate rich snooty people. They always have to have the best of everything. And I was like, look at mine. Uh- Mine's better than yours, and I just, it felt more, because it is a convention, but it's a convention only rich people can get to do it to being on the cruise ship. Except in this case, everybody there got a free ticket. Well, true, I guess. I guess we'll come to some rich snooty people, but I... There are, there are definitely a couple rich snooty people, but these were just like, you know, average looking kids showing off their Pokemon. Like, didn't you ever have that conversation like back in the day? Like, wow, this, uh, my Pokemon can beat your Pokemon kind of thing. No, I always knew mine were the I best. Did. I didn't I did. need to argue. No, oh, okay, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> just then an announcer comes on and we see that a Pokemon battle has begun. A Starmie and a Raticate begin battling. It appears to be a draw. Raticate uses a Super Fang, and this finally defeats the Starmie. The trainer is sad that his Starmie was injured. The other challenger, a guy that looks like a stereotypical magician, tells the kid not to feel too bad because it was just a practice match and that he has not happened to be lucky. Or that he just happened to be lucky. Some random woman walks up to him, puts her arm on him, and says... My, how gracious, in a Southern Belle accent. He responds in the same accent, Not at all, miss. He then tells the kids to keep working on his Starmie's strengths and asks if anyone else wants to battle. And and, uh, at a point, I'm not entirely sure if this woman who walked up is like his wife or his girlfriend or whatever, because in this scene, I got the opinion that he did not previously know her, and she was just like, Mmm, I dig your Pokemon battling skills. And she, like, comes up and immediately falls for him. But then later on in the episode, it does seem that they're more established than that, so I have no idea. I guess it doesn't matter, but it was something that I noticed. Ash gets excited and asks the man if he wants to battle his Butterfree. The man agrees. Yeah, and in the dub he goes, I can't wait, and he has fire in his eyes, which makes more sense in the Japanese original, because he actually said, I'm all fired up, which I don't know why they had to change that, because it made sense in this context. That's probably true, yeah, I I have no idea. Just then, we flash over to Jesse and James walking into the room dressed as servers and carrying a tray of drinks. James says, my, this place is packed, and Jesse says, yes, and packed with Pokemon. James comments that soon the Pokemon will be all theirs. Going back off of our previous discussion, what do you think is the reason that they do not wear the traditional Team Rocket outfits? Maybe they don't feel that the color palette looks good on them. Yeah, That could be, but my thought was maybe the boss doesn't want them to ruin the name of Team Rocket, so he gave them separate outfits. Possibly. He should probably talk to them about constantly saying that they're Team Rocket and uh, doing the Team Rocket poem thing that they do every single episode. Yeah, it's kind of like my job. You can get in big trouble if you say you're board certified and you're actually not. Right. At this point, the battle between Ash and the magician dude begins. And I call him the magician dude because he kind of looks like an old school magician. They're probably going for like snooty rich guy with a top hat type look. But the dude looks like a magician, so I'm just going to roll with that. The Raticate begins with a jump kick and Butterfree uses tackle. 
They begin bouncing around in the sky, hitting one another. Misty asks Brock if Butterfree stands a chance, and Brock responds by saying that he thinks it's a good match. And at this point, I'm starting to feel like the anime never really needed Brock, and that they just use him to make observation and hit on girls. If you look at it, Ash and Misty have, like, kind of, you know, their love... They love each other and hate each other at the same time, and Brock is just like, cool, yeah, this is it. He's like only there so we have someone who knows what they're going on, but isn't really that fleshed out of a character. That's probably true. I I don't know. Hopefully he'll get his chance in later episodes. Just then, Raticate uses a fang attack and it misses Butterfree. Butterfree then uses Stun Spore, and it is effective. Ash tells Butterfree to use Whirlwind, and just then the Magician comes in, picks up his Raticate, and says, That's enough, let's just call it a draw. He walks away, and Ash gets upset, saying that this isn't fair, because he was winning, and I actually agree with Ash on this one. He was about to win. I am really surprised that Ash did not throw a fit here. I mean, it's showing good character growth on his part. Yeah, I agree. Good for him. We then see James walking along the convention floor. A vendor calls him over and asks him to look at a Pokemon. James walks over and asks what it is. The vendor explains it is the king of all carp, a Magikarp. James asks if he should eat it, and without answering, the vendor hands over the Pokemon and asks James to see how healthy it is. The vendor then explains that this Pokemon is a gold mine because it can lay 1,000 eggs at one time. The vendor explains that each of these eggs will hatch more Magikarp, who will each lay 1,000 more eggs. Eventually, he will have 1 billion Pokemon. James seems impressed, and the vendor explains that he can sell each one of these for $100, and in three generations, he will have billions of dollars. This, of course, really excites James. He falls right for the sales pitch, and the vendor offers to sell him an entire set of educational materials and the Magikarp for $300. James happily agrees and pays the man. Yeah, and this was a reference to the games where you can buy a Magikarp for 500 Poké Dollars. I believe it is right before Mount Moon. It's pretty early in the game. I just always thought Magikarp was frustrating because you had to train them up, and it was kind of the age-old story of the weak Pokémon turning into the huge dragon when it turned into Gyarados. But you got a Magikarp pretty early, and you could get a Gyarados pretty early if you really tried hard. But you actually had to work for it. Now, in the most recent games, the experience share just needs you to have Magikarp in your team to gain experience, and I think that's a cop-out. I mean, I used it. I have a Gyarados in my Pokemon Sword, but definitely wasn't as hard to get a Gyarados now as it was back then. And then, after James buys his Magikarp, that's when we go into the Who's That Pokemon segment. Who's That Pokemon? All right, and... This week's Who's That Pokemon is Raticate, who in Japanese was called Rata. Here's some information about Raticate. He's number 20 in the Pokedex. His typing is normal type in, in his regular form, and in Alola, he is dark in normal type. He's 2 foot 4 inches regularly and 2 foot 4 inches in Alola, so both of them. He's 40.8 pounds regularly and 56.2 pounds in Alola. He is known as the mouse Pokemon, and he does not evolve. He is a final evolution. All right, his name origin. Raticate seems to be a combination of rat and eradicate, to destroy or exterminate, or masticate, which means to chew, relating to its mouth and its teeth. Uh, his Japanese name origin. Rata is just derived from rat, simple as that. What is he based off of? The original Raticate appears to be based on a brown rat as well as a semi-aquatic rodent such as a muskrat or a koipu due to its large body and webbed feet. Its scruffy ears resemble those of a guinea pig. The Alolan Raticate appears to be based on the black rat and the Polynesian rat, an invasive species in Hawaii, which makes perfect sense because Alola is based off of Hawaii. It is also reminiscent of a stereotypical crime boss due to its gluttonous behavior ability to command groups of Rattata to steal in hostile relationship with the detective-inspired gumshoes. Raticate's Biology Raticate is a large rodent-like Pokemon, although it is often depicted on its hind legs. It is a quadruped. It is primarily tawny-colored with a cream underside. 
He has narrow black eyes and ears with a with ragged edges and dark insides and large incisors that grow constantly. There are three whiskers on each side of its face, which it uses to maintain balance. It has short arms with three-fingered hands and webbed feet with three toes. The webbing on its feet allow it to swim. Its tail is long and scaly. A female will have shorter whiskers and lighter fur. In Alola, Radicae has become heavier and darker due to its urban environment and higher calorie diet. Its fur is mostly black with brown leaf-shaped patch on its belly and brown inside its ears. Its hands, feet, cheeks, and tails are whitish cream color and its hands are much smaller. It has large puffy cheeks with four whiskers under its chin and two sprouting sideways from the top of each cheek. Its large incisors are still visible but its eyes are now red. This variant uses its nest as a food stockpile and generally prefers to have the Alolan Rattata it commands to go out and forage for food while it remains in its nest and eats. It is selective in what it eats, however, only fresh, high-quality foods such as fruits. Rumor has it that a certain high-class restaurant even exploits this selectivity, bringing Radicate and Lawn to buy ingredients and letting it taste test new dishes. That sounds gross, bringing a rat along to do your grocery shopping. Yeah, that would be disgusting. Alright, some Pokedex entries on Raticate. Red and Blue states, It uses its whiskers to maintain its balance. It apparently slows down if they are cut off. Yellow, P- Pokedex states, its, hands f- its hind feet are webbed. They act as flippers so it can swim in rivers and hunt for prey. Pokemon Gold says it gnaws on anything with its tough fangs. It can even topple concrete buildings by gnawing on them. Which is kind of scary if you think about it. Like, you know, rats are typically a city dwellers, and you have these radicates that can just destroy buildings. A ruby and sapphire states, Radicate's sturdy fangs grow steadily to keep them ground down and gnaws on rocks and logs. It may even chew on the walls of houses. Pokemon Moon says, Its disposition is far more violent than it looks would suggest. Don't let your hand get too close to its face, as it could bite your hand clean off. And my question is, who doesn't think Eradicate looks vicious? They look terrifying. Yeah, that'd be a terrifying Pokemon to roll into in a dark alleyway. Yeah. Uh, And then a couple Pokedex entries about its Alolan form. Pokemon Sun says it forms a group of Rattata, which it assumes command of. Each group has its own territory, and disputes over food happens often. In Pokemon Moon, Alolan form says, This gourmet Pokemon is particular about the taste and freshness of its food. Restaurants where Raticate live have a good reputation. So kind of the opposite of other restaurants when you see a rat in a restaurant. Alright, and that's the Who's That Pokemon segment. Who's That Pokemon? After the break where we have the Who's That Pokemon, we come back and flash over to a table where the party is eating a ton of food. Just then, the magician fancy guy with, like, the top hat comes over with the same girl from before, and Brock is mesmerized. The magician compliments Ash on his Butterfree and asks Ash what he thought of the Raticate. Ash says it looks great and put up a tough fight. The magician offers to trade Ash for his Butterfree and then has to explain to Ash that Pokemon trading is common because apparently Ash somehow did not know this. So, like, I feel like trading is a huge part of Pokemon, but he he, he doesn't know about this yet, apparently. He explains that trading and making new friends is one of the best parts of having Pokemon. It allows friendships to spread all over the world. At the same time, Brock says to the lady that came up as well that he wants to be friends with her. So Brock is like, you know, badly trying to hit on this guy's wife or girlfriend or whoever that came up to the table. And of course, he says this in a creepy way while blushing. You know, he's like, he's like, oh, I want to be friends with you. Calm down. Calm down, Brock. Go take a cold shower. Ash asks Brock if he should trade. And Brock, still mesmerized by the beautiful woman, says that he should definitely trade. Ash agrees to trade, and they go over some weird trading machine, where they place their Pokeballs down and push a button, and this swaps the Pokeballs, completing the trade. Ash doesn't seem too entirely impressed with this trade. And I just want to take a moment to throw out, now that they've traded and Ash doesn't seem too thrilled with it, I really hope that Ash doesn't turn into being one of those, like, annoying kids that is always trying to trade everything back. Those kids really irritated me back in the day. No takesy-backsies, people. (laughs) 
in Ash's defense, the guy was obviously conning him. Like, he was, like, trying to guilt Ash into giving him his Butterfree. And who would trade a Butterfree for a Raticate? That seems like a stupid move. I would do that, because I don't like Raticates. Yes, from the guy's point of view, but would you give them him a Butterfree for a Raticate? I don't know. Yeah, and that machine I also thought was interesting. What, why do they have to use that machine? Why can't they just give each other's Pokeball? Do you think it, like, changes the psyche of the Pokemon? So it knows who it has to follow now? Probably. I, I have no idea. I didn't look into it that deep. It's probably just a way to make it more official. Maybe. We then flash over to James being called an idiot by Jesse and Meowth for spending $300 on a Magikarp and some training materials. Meowth scratches it and Jesse explains that Magikarp is a no-talent Pokemon that just flops around. He asks him how he expects to sell all those Magikarp. Yeah, the guy also told James it was in a solid gold Pokeball, and that's why Meowth scratches the Pokeball, because he scratches it to show that it was only gold-plated. Right. She then asks where he got the money, and he sheepishly explains that the advance on his salary wasn't enough to cover it, so he gave her money away as well. Jesse promptly kicks him in the mouth and one of his teeth flies out. She tells him that he is getting her money back. Honestly, I don't understand how James fell for this. I thought they were more informed about the world of Pokemon than Ash. They seemed to like to be, even though they were the bad guys, they kind of had it all together. I'm like speechless right now. Are you saying that prior to this, in your opinion, Team Rocket had their stuff together? Okay, they didn't have their stuff together, but their Pokemon knowledge was always there. Okay. Yeah, we're just gonna have to agree to disagree on that one. Like, this is totally, totally within character for James, in my I opinion. I guess, James, I guess I'm thinking they always have the knowledge when Meowth is with them. These people literally regularly set traps and fall into their own traps. Okay? Like, let's not, let's not give them too much credit here. <laughs> like, holy cow. We then change scenes to see Ash leaning over the side of the ship, looking at the water and feeling sad. Misty walks up and asks what is wrong. He explains that he wonders if that guy he traded is really going to take good care of Butterfree. He says that he doesn't even know the guy and has no idea if he will take care of it the way he did. Well, Ash, I certainly hope that he takes better care of it than you have thus far. Misty tells him to look on the bright side because he now has Eradicate, but this doesn't help Ash and he reminisces about when Butterfree saved their butts and evolved. Probably the only good time he has had with Butterfree. So he like reminisces about the one positive thing that has happened while he's had Butterfree. And he's like, ah, that one good time. I sure miss Butterfree. I've had a lot of like one good times with a lot of bad things before. Okay, Jeff. <laughs> I think like, we've had a lot of sh few good times with a lot of bad things before. Yeah, like like it was good one time and then, you know, the rest of it, I, I can do without it. We change scenes again to see the boss of Team Rocket watching the security camera footage of the convention hall on the ship. He says it won't be long now, and his Persian screeches. As he does this, all the doors swing shut on the convention hall, and Team Rocket commandos all come out of disguise. This shocks the crowd of people. We also see James limping around saying, Hey, hombre, I want my money back. He appears to have some sort of concussion after getting kicked in the head by Jesse. Jesse then grabs him and asks him if he is crazy. She says that they have work to do, because obviously the plan's going down at this point. They then begin to do the little poem intro, but, J intro, but James isn't super into it as normal. Uh, they announce that Team Rocket will take possession of all the Pokemon on the ship, and, and all of the agents begin to suck up people's Pokeballs with a vacuum. So, like, all these, like, commando agents come down, and they have these vacuums, and they just start sucking people's Pokeballs up with it. One of the commandos walks up to Ash and tells him to give up his Pokemon, but Pikachu shocks him and knocks him to the ground. Ash then says, if you are going to try to rob our Pokemon, then we might as well make it a battle. The crowd agrees with him. Everyone starts throwing out their Pokeballs as Team Rocket continues to suck up the other Pokeballs with the vacuums. Jesse yells, yeah, suck them up, suck them up, over and over again she says this um, as she is sucking Pokeballs up with the vacuum. I don't know if Team Rocket expected this, but if you attack a group of Pokemon trainers, you should expect to be attacked. 
I just feel like this plan was not all the way thought through, even though it was from the higher ups. Yeah, I don't give Team Rocket any credit ever on anything, so I wasn't too surprised by this. But yes, they definitely should have expected some resistance. I mean, for all they know, apparently there's guns in this world. Like, how do they know somebody didn't have, like, some gun and whip it out? I mean, like, bam, James is dead now. Like, you don't know. The magician throws out a Squirtle, and Brock says, We've got to fight them together, but doesn't actually throw out a Pokemon himself. Ash tells Pikachu to go, and a bunch of other Pikachu jump down, forming a Pikachu pyramid, like a cheerleader pyramid, but with Pikachu. They begin to electroblast Team Rocket. And as this happens, Ash throws out Charmander, and the same thing happens. We now have a Charmander pyramid, and they begin to fire blast Team Rocket. At this point, Brock decides that it's probably pertinent to help, and he throws out his Geodude. You can guess it, a whole bunch of other Geodude come out, grab, they grab hands and form a circle and begin spinning around, knocking away a bunch of Team Rocket commandos. A Bulbasaur pyramid, holy cow, this is getting exhausting with all the pyramids, a Bulbasaur pyramid then shows up, and they begin to vine-whipping them. Overall, Team Rocket is getting beaten pretty good, and we've got more pyramids than a national cheerleading competition at this point. Like, there's just pyramids, people forming pyramids all over this ship, and they're blasting people. It's kind of a weird time. Butterfreeze are also then seen flying around, and they are uh, stun-sporing Team Rocket, and Ash then says, Now it's my turn, which makes no sense, because he's already had several turns, but whatever. He yells, Go Butterfree, as he throws a Pokeball, but it is a Raticate. Ash is surprised, and Misty reminds them that he traded Butterfree. He then gets sad and reminisces once again of the one good time that he had with Butterfree, the time that Butterfree evolved. You must have really hated Metapod if that's the one thing is the, the time he got rid of Metapod and it became a Butterfree. I mean, when the, re- when the rest of your time with a Pokemon is just spent being lost in the woods and probably starving and losing battles and things like that, I, I, you kind of cling on to the one good thing. And, and this is that one good thing, I guess. I, it was pretty cool how, how they saved the day when that happened, don't get me wrong, but... Yeah, he's definitely clinging on to that one moment. Ash then says that he raised Butterfree all by himself and that he wants to get it back. So Ash is definitely the annoying tradesy baxy kid after all. I should have predicted this. Yeah, I always hated those kids. Though I did really like this scene when all the Pokemon are fighting Team Rocket. It was just a fun, action-packed battle that... It was just fun to watch the whole scene play out it was a cool scene too many pyramids that's my that's my criticism of it the pyramid thing was a bit much maybe like one or two pyramids but seriously they had four pyramids going and they had to like specially set up each one it's like all right let's uh move it along with the pyramids here pokemon it was probably easy for the animators to do it that way is my guess probably probably there had to be a reason but yeah, the Tradesy Baxy kids, the, they drove me nuts. There was a big Tradesy Baxy kid at my school. His name was Seth. And Seth, if you traded with him, he'd always want to trade you back. And if you told him no, he'd get his mom involved. And then the mom would call the school. Do you know how many times I had to go down to the principal's office because I wouldn't trade Seth back? And he tattled on his mom to me. And then she called the school. <laughs> they happened multiple times. Yes, I'm still salty about it. I'm a 32-year-old man with an adult job. And I'm still upset that I had to trade my Pokemon card back to Seth. Seth, wherever you are, I hope that you've gotten over those childish, childish things. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Seth, if you're listening. (laughs) He he might be. Just then, another Team Rocket member shows up and asks him to hand over his Pokemon. Ash throws out Pidgeotto. Pidgeotto groups up with a bunch of others, and they use a powerful gust that blows a bunch of Team Rocket out of the ship. Pikachu forms another Pikachu pyramid and uses Thunderbolt. This appears to blast the remaining Team Rocket members out of the ship, and everyone begins to cheer. Ash says that they should all be proud of their Pokemon and says that they all taught Team Rocket a lesson they will never forget. At this point, we see Jesse, James, and Meowth crawling down the hallway of the ship in pain, but a huge wave hits the ship from a storm that has started brewing outside, and this knocks James's Magikarp Pokeball out of his hand. It rolls down the hall, and James begins chasing it. Jesse and Meowth take off after him. 
Another wave hits, and this scares all the people in the convention room. Misty looks out the window and remarks that this is a real big storm. Brock says it will be hard to get back with waves like that. Thank you, Brock. No one would have guessed that one, I guess. Like, there's literally waves crashing against the ship and it's rocking. But, you know, whatever, I guess. I'm not going to go into that. Misty then says, hey, where is Ash? And looks over to see Ash and the magician dude standing by the trading machine. The magician is asking Ash if he really wants to go back on their trade. Ash says that it is the first Pokemon he ever captured and asks if he can have it back. The fancy magician guy reluctantly trades him back, saying that he has no choice. At least the guy was willing to trade Ash back. He was lucky for that. I mean, he could have easily just disappeared and had a way cooler Pokemon than Eradicate. I guess. I always thought Butterfree was kind of lame, personally. But, you know, he, he, Ash is very lucky that he allowed the tradesy backsies because that's that's pretty much sacrilege in the Pokemon world. Like, you don't tradesy backsy, Seth. Uh, unless you're trading, like, a Haunter or, Mach- or Machoke so you can get the Machamp and Gengar to get trade them back. Well, yeah, when there's, like, you know, obvious reasons to trade to, like, evolve a Pokemon. I've done that before. I'm talking, like, but that's gr- agreed upon in the beginning. Yes. Like, you know you're going to be trading it back. You know, when when, when you are when you think you're the proud new owner of a, of a holographic Bulbasaur, and then Seth tells his mom on you, and you get called in and are forced to give up your Pokemon card, that's, that's what I'm talking about here, those tradesy backsy kids. Forget you, Seth but I do hope you're okay these days. You know, it's a wild world out there. Anyway, we then see the captain of the ship hanging on for dear life as the ship rocks. He is clearly afraid, but says it is okay because the ship is unsinkable. Where have we heard this before, Mr. Captain? Why don't you tell that to Jack? Oh, wait, because he froze to death in the North Atlantic after going down in an unsinkable ship. That's why. I had the exact same comment. I mean, not as detailed, but... I just had something along the lines of, wow, where have I heard about an unsinkable ship before? But this is a good lesson. You should never label anything as unbreakable, impenetrable, or unsinkable. You are just asking for something really bad to happen. I think Elon Musk needs to take that advice. If you recall uh, his Tesla truck thing where he said that it was an unbreakable window and then threw a brick through it. (laughs) It was not unbreakable. That was a beautiful scene. I guess I have not I have not seen that, but I need I go in to have to look this oh. up. Oh. Oh, you need to Google it. He showed this like Tesla truck, this like electric truck, and they're like, these windows are unbreakable. And then to demonstrate, he threw a brick through the window and it was not unbreakable. <laughs> it was in fact very breakable. It must have been live. A, yeah, it was a great video though. You could look it up on YouTube. It's a good time. The boat continues to rock, and the captain then gets in a lifeboat and begins to be lowered into the ocean. He tells everyone not to panic because he is just testing out the lifeboat. Everyone starts to clamor onto the lifeboat, and Misty tells Ash to hurry as he is still trading back his Pokemon. And I'm going to have to put this captain on the wall of shame for this. That is horrible. Oh yeah, this captain's going deep on the wall of shame. Like, he didn't even warn everybody. He's just like, I'm just going to go on this lifeboat and let you all die. Yeah, I mean, he's not Damien levels, I, or is he? I mean, it's a huge group of people he's just trying to leave out there. Yeah, you gotta imagine that he was trying to abandon hundreds of people in the ocean, so I'm thinking he's pretty bad. He's pretty high up on our list. Wall of shame, here you come, Captain, whatever your name is. Once Ash's trade is completed, Ash holds his Butterfree's Pokeball and asks it to forgive him, but another large wave hits and it knocks the Pokeball out of his hand and begins rolling down the deck. Ash and the party go chasing after it, and at the same time we also see Rocket chasing after their Pokeball that they have lost. Right as Ash grabs his Pokeball, another large wave comes and this knocks them all through a door. The same also happens to Team Rocket. The whole ship then flips upside down as terrified onlookers watch from their lifeboats. Wow, Jeff, they really could have used their skills. You know, they really could have used your skills in this situation. You know, they got a sinking boat. They're on these lifeboats. But oh, wait, this water was probably more than three feet deep. I was certified in up to six feet of water. Thank you very much. Was it six feet? I thought it was. Nope, it was six feet. It is. It might have been five. It was whatever they count as a shallow end of a pool. Okay, so they're not in the shallow end of a pool, so they probably wouldn't have been able to use you. 
They're they're in the ocean. That's that's not Jeff territory. Jeff territory is water you can stand up in. I'm yes. sorry, Jeff. I just have to rib you for that. Jeff did save me from drowning one time. I mean, kind of. He gives himself more credit than it's worth, but I still have to make fun of him for it. By saving Tyler from drowning means Tyler was drifting away from the side of the pool on the deep end, and it was like one of those Olympic lane pools. I don't know if it's a. I don't think it was Olympic sized, but it went like ten feet deep. Yeah, it was very deep, and I couldn't swim. That's why we were there. We were learning how to swim. <laughs> and I don't think it's helped. I still am not a great swimmer. Yeah, me neither. But anyway, I started to float away, and Jeff grabbed me. He's like, never let go. And unlike Rose, he never let go. <laughs> I'm more reliable than Rose. I mean, everybody's more reliable than Rose. Jesus, she let Jack float to the bottom of the ocean after freezing to death. All right, I need to get off the Titanic thing in this episode. It was just, it was obvious that it had to happen, but I, I feel like I've gone too far with it. I mean, Tyler, at least there was room for both of us on the side of the pool. That's true. There was room for both of us. The captain then stands up and asks anyone who couldn't leave the ship safely to say aye. He is satisfied when nobody does. Again, wall of shame. We then hear the narrator explaining that not everyone is safe because Team Rocket and Ash and his party are all unconscious on the St. Anne as it is sinking. The narrator wonders if this is the end. And then says that he has a terrible sinking feeling as we see the ship sinking upside down underwater. This is not a time for jokes, Mr. Narrator. Yeah, Mr. Narrator, read the room. Like, we've got unconscious people going down in this ship, and who knows, there could be more people than just them on there. How do we know somebody isn't already dead in one of the lower decks or something? They don't know that. This is not a time for jokes. To be continued after this bad pun, comes across the screen, and we have just experienced, I think it's our first cliffhanger of the series. Yeah, I mean, you could count other episodes as cliffhangers because it's like, you see the city, and then it says to be continued or whatever. But this is like, where one episode clearly comes next. You know, you're going to start with Ash and Company and Team Rocket down in the ship. Obviously, I hope it's not right. too much of spoilers. They survive because uh, they have over a thousand episodes later. Jeff Walker. How do we know that they survive? Like, and there just wasn't new characters or something. I didn't know that. Wow, you just spoiled everything for me. <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, but yeah, again, another really fun episode. I really enjoyed it as, I mean, this episode and the next two are part of my like three favorite arcs three favorite my favorite three episode arc in the anime that i can remember yeah both the last two episodes have been really great so far it was nice after that like period of time where i'm like wow there's a lot of bad filler going on here yeah and it'll be fun to see what happens to ash and company down in that ship and if you want to give your comments on this episode, please send us a tweet at Pokemon Snapshot. You can email us at thepokemonsnapshot at gmail.com. If you could please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, that will help other Pokemon fans like yourself find us. And Tyler, that's the end of our episode. So join us next week where we will be watching episode 16, Pokemon Shipwreck. I hope Ash and Misty and Brock don't die and wreck our good time. <laughs> <laughs>